my uh, life back home who um, grew up in, in a home uh, probably like most of you. Her parents loved her very, very much, taught her. Uh, she started attending the meetings of the church nine months before she was born. And, um, and that's how she grew up. Uh, when she was 15 years old, she started secretly dating a 25-year-old man. When she, uh, the day she turned 16, she, she left. Um, she left a family that loved her. She left a family that um, provided for her, that taught her, that protected her, that fed her. And she left all of that um, to go to a man in a home that introduced her to alcohol and drugs, um, choked her to unconsciousness, threw her down the stairs. She left, um, she left one of the better situations a person could have and ended up in one of the most miserable situations that a person could have. My brother and I worked at the same place at that point, and I walked into I walked into work one day, and and um, a Marine sniper had offered. Uh, he had heard about all of this horrific situation, and and he had offered to um, to kill the guy. And um, when you love somebody and, and they're in a situation like that, uh, it was a little bit tempting. It's not like I thought about it seriously. Like I never, I never thought about it seriously, honestly. Um, but I'd be lying if I didn't say that it was a little bit tempting. And immediately two things popped into my head. Um, number one, obviously that's not, that's not of the Lord, right? You can't deal with things that way. Number two, immediately popped into my head, um, it wouldn't solve the problem. Do you know what I mean by that? This, this, um, this precious girl had chosen this horrifically sad life. And you, you, couldn't, you couldn't solve the problem by just killing the abuser, right? It wouldn't solve the problem. It's incredibly sad when people make choices to live, they have everything handed right to them and they could live like this. And then they make choices to live like this. It's incredibly sad, isn't it? There's millions upon millions. There are probably billions of stories on planet Earth just like that. It's incredibly sad. Now, I'm telling you that for a very specific purpose tonight. We've been, we've been talking this week about abiding in Christ. We've been talking about seeing your sin the way God sees it, seeing the lost the way God sees them, seeing the Christians the way God sees them. And I'm, I'm very burdened tonight. Um, this is my parting thought for all of you. I'm very burdened uh, to leave you with this thought. It is desperately important that you guys see yourselves the way Christ sees you. It is desperately important that you see yourselves the way Christ sees you. If you're taking notes, then um, just jot down the title, How Do We Proceed? And my answer to that is, By Grace Through Faith. How do we proceed on from this week? By grace, through faith. A number of you um, received this book, Abide in Christ. 
I wanted just to read you a couple paragraphs here. Colossians 2, 6, and 7. As you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. That's so important. I'll read it again. As you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him, established in the faith, abounding therein. In these words, the apostle teaches us the weighty lesson that it is not only by faith that we first come to Christ and are united to him, but that it is by faith that we are to be rooted and established in our union with Christ. Not less essential than for, than for the commencement is faith for the progress of the spiritual life. Abiding in Jesus can only be by faith. There are earnest Christians who do not understand this, or if they admit it in theory, they fail to realize its application in practice. They are very zealous for a free gospel with our first acceptance of Christ and justification by faith alone. But after this, they think everything depends on our diligence and our faithfulness. While they firmly grasp the truth, the sinner shall be justified by faith. They have hardly found a place in their scheme for the larger truth. The just shall live by faith. They have never understood what a perfect Savior Jesus is and how he will each day do for the sinner just as much He's so precious, isn't he? The Lord Jesus is amazing. He's amazing. How each day he will do for the sinner just as much as he did the first day when we came to him. They know not that the life of grace is always and only a life of faith. In that relationship to Jesus, the once daily and unceasing duty of the disciple is to believe because believing is the one channel through which divine grace and strength flow out into the heart of man. The old nature of the believer remains evil and sinful to the last. It is only as he daily comes all empty and helpless to his Savior to receive of his life and strength that he can bring forth fruits of righteousness to the glory of God. Therefore, it is as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, being rooted and grounded in him, established in the faith, abounding therein. As you came to Jesus, so abide in him by faith. Lord, I love the people in this room. And uh, as Phi told us very aptly this morning, you love the people in this room. Lord, my love, at the very best, my love would be like a, a cigarette lighter. And your love, it's even a pitiful comparison to say your love is like the burning of the sun. You have an infinite divine love for the people in this room. You will love them perfectly. You will love them persistently. You will love them selflessly. <laughs> Lord, I pray that you would, would just say one more thing to them this week. I pray that you would establish them, that you would strengthen them, that you would comfort them, that you would send them out with exactly what they need so that their lives don't end up like, like the one that I know. Father, I have to say tonight, I'm afraid. I'm afraid for them. Not because of things I see in their lives. I, I don't know them that well. I'm afraid for them because I've lived for 42 years. I've seen a lot of groups of staff come and go from camps. And at least 50% of their lives just don't go well. Having saved them from hell, Lord God, now I pray that you would save them from stupid choices. Save them from misunderstandings of your word and your grace. Save them from what they're walking into 10 years from now if they don't learn to hold you by your hand and stay close to you every day for the rest of their lives. Father, I just commit tonight to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Go to 1 Corinthians 10 if you would, or 1 Corinthians 15, 10.
in your Bibles. <coughs> By the way, the girl that I told you about, um, she got saved when she was 21. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. She's a trophy of God's grace today. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Yeah, our God is so good, and He's so He's so capable of saving souls. First Corinthians fifteen. I said ten. Let's read nine for the context. First Corinthians fifteen nine says, "For I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and His grace toward me was not in vain." But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach and so you believed. I just want to send you out with this simple thought tonight. The only way that you're going to continue successfully for Christ is by grace through faith. I already read you just the first couple paragraphs of one of those thoughts in, in Abide in Me, um, where he stresses, as you began, so you must continue. So no person in this room ever got saved any other way except by grace through faith. And the scripture is so clear, right? The same way that you got saved, that's how you carry on. So I love this verse. Fi actually mentioned this on day one. Um, I love this verse because it says grace three times. By the grace of God, I am what I am. His grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. And so it just stresses what I really think we need to stress as, as we leave this week that we must carry on by faith or by grace through faith. Now, I love it that Paul is honest about his sin. Many of you have this week have said, I want to go deeper. Uh, many of you have come to me with tears, um, come to others with tears, and you've talked about, about choices of sin, habits of sin. You, you wonder how these things can be overcome. Boy, I just cannot stress this enough. They are overcome by grace through faith. They're overcome as you abide in Christ. Look, look at the perspective of the Apostle Paul. He was honest about his sin. By the way, if I asked us at the beginning of the week if we would be honest, I so appreciate those of you uh, that have been honest with me. And I really hope that all of you have been honest with the Lord who already knows everything, right? Notice here that the Apostle Paul was very honest. For I am the least of the apostles, he says in verse 9. I am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. This is not just some fake humility, right? It's not just him trying to kind of take the lowly place. He has a very tangible reason that he says he is the least and that he is not worthy. And that was that he persecuted the church of God. That's Acts 6 and Acts 7. Acts 8. Right in that portion of Acts. Paul was presiding over, over uh, what do you call it? The martyrdom, the killing, the stoning of Stephen. Do you remember that? They laid their clothing, right? They took off their outer garments. They laid their clothing at the feet of a young man named Saul, right? What, what that means contextually is that he was in charge. He actually gave them his permission, his authority for the, the stoning of one of the followers of Christ. So, so I want you to notice this. The Apostle Paul never got over his sin, and that's important. In the context, it's important. He never got over his sin. But this is, this is the incredibly vital truth. Here, he says, I'm the least. He says, I'm not worthy because I persecuted the church of God. But then he says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. Notice the perspective of Paul. He never got over his sin. He let it produce a humility in him, but it drove him to the cross of Christ. It drove him to the grace of God. When you notice this tendency in your life that, that, that 
sin comes to your mind, if it makes you feel like God would never love me, that's the enemy. Whether it's the world, the flesh, or the devil, that is not Christ. That is not God. That's what the devil would love to see, is, oh, God could never love me. God could never use me. I'm broken. I'm not worth it. All of those feelings, that's the enemy talking. When you are reminded of your sin and it drives you to weep at the feet of, of Christ and, and to, to beg for his forgiveness and then to accept his forgiveness because you're not smarter than God. And so you accept his forgiveness, allow him to wash your feet, right? That's the proper relationship to sin. Is what I'm saying making sense? It is good and biblical never to get over your sin, but only in this context. It, it drives you back. Let me just give you an example. I, I needed to rest this morning, and so I didn't leave my room until after, after or I didn't leave the apartment, until after 10 o'clock. I woke up at a normal time, but I sat there with my regular coffee, my decaf coffee, my tea, um, and my Bible, and, um, and I just sat there with the Lord. And I, I had a fabulous time with the Lord this morning. For hours, I sat there on my bed with my Bible and just drank cup after cup um, with, with the Lord. I had a great time. I was reading through the scriptures and, and just enjoying myself, reading through the scriptures. And then all of a sudden, boom, the Lord shows me a scripture. And he says, look, Scott, that's a lifelong sin in your life. And so I sat there on my bed with my drink and my God, and I said, Lord, I've had enough of that. And I said, first, would you please forgive me? And then his instantaneously, he forgives us, right? We've never met a person like this. So incredibly kind. Instantaneously, he forgives us. And then I said, Lord, I've had enough of that. I'm tired of that. I desperately need you to change me to be like Christ. I, I don't just want to be forgiven. I want, I want to be changed. I don't want that lifelong sin to continue. I want it to be done. That, makes, that produces a humility in people when you see your sin, Right? Micah stood up here. Was it this morning, Micah? Last night. He stood up here. And Micah has had kind of a brutal week with the Lord. And I mean this in a good way, but Micah has really wrestled with, between he and the Lord. And he told you some about that last night. The Lord has been working on me. The Lord has been working on Bethany and Benson. The Lord has been working on Garrick. The Lord has been working on Micah. The Lord has been working on my wife. This is the loving hand of a heavenly father. Boy, when he shows you your sin, it's okay never to get over your sin in the sense that the apostle Paul does, but let it drive you to the cross. Let it drive you to the grace of God. In fact, if you just leave here with one phrase, it would be this one. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Can we all say that together? But by the grace of God, I am what I am. One more time. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. What Paul is saying is that he never gets over his sin, but he lets it drive him to the grace of God, to the cross of Christ, to the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what you have to do. Let your sin drive you to the grace of God. By the grace of God, I am what I am. This is the, this is the biggest point that I want to make tonight to you, is you must live in accordance with what you are. It's why I told you a miserable story. Hopefully, in some small way, just to illustrate how deeply sad it is when somebody actually is this, but they choose to live like this. Um, Veronica and Adam. I don't know where Adam is. Is he in the room? Oh, he's gone. Okay. Hey, I just want to throw this out there as an idea. I think it would be amazing, like as a staff study, um, maybe just a future idea, but I just think it would be amazing to actually have a study where you just walk through what the New Testament says about what we are. I think that that would be so, so cool. And I just want to throw it out as an idea. I want to give you two. 
Um, we will come right back to this passage, but there are two that I just want to show you um, to send you out from this week. This is who you are. The first one is 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. In verse number 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. If you are in new Christ, if you are in Christ, excuse me, you are a new creation. Please don't ever forget that. Please don't ever forget that. Don't ever live like you're not a new creation in Christ. Who's smarter, you or God? Yeah, don't ever live like you're smarter. I don't know how else to say it. Do you guys find it hard to accept the love of God? I don't know. When I was your age, honestly, I don't know if I had a hard time accepting the love of God. I don't remember, honestly. Now, (laughs) I have a hard time accepting the love of God. I don't know why. I feel so unworthy of it. I laid in bed, um, this is months ago now, I laid in bed and I couldn't sleep and um, my wife is a light sleeper and so I was laying there as still as I could so to try to not, not wake her up and, um, and I lifted my hands to the Lord and I just started enjoying his presence and, and I was just enjoying communion with God. And, and, then, um, and then he started to assure me of all these things. And honestly, they're too precious and they're too personal for me to share them. He just started to shower me with these, these kind, this kindness, this love. And, and I went from having my hands up in the air and just just radically just wonderfully enjoying communion with God and then he started showering me with his love and i dropped my hands and i dropped my head like this and i just couldn't hardly accept it he's so overwhelmingly kind he's so overwhelmingly accepting he's so overwhelmingly loving i came into his presence uh, i was in a hotel room in virginia and um, I, I wasn't feeling very good, and so I won't drink any, I promise. Um, but I came into his presence, and I was just sitting on my hotel bed with coffee. There's something about coffee and God that just seems to go nicely together. And, um, and I was just sitting there, and, um, and eventually I just sat down my coffee, and, and just by faith, right, I just, I just, I I guess it's the way I pictured it, but I just grabbed his his hand um, and I just put it just like this. And I just said, Lord, I could just, oh, Lord, I could just stay here forever. I don't ever want to leave this place. I don't ever want to leave this presence. And then the Lord starts assuring you, you know, Scott, I enjoy you more than you enjoy me. And I find it so hard to take in. I don't remember. I'm just trying to be honest. I don't remember when I was your age if I, if I even thought about these things. But what I'm telling you is that you have to believe God. When he says that you're a new creation, when he says if any man is in Christ, old things are passed away, all things have become new. You have to believe him because you'll probably end up living according to your beliefs. Does that make sense? If you think you're used, if you think you're abused, if you think nobody would really want someone like me, then you very well may go down that path and and live that way. If you think, no, I'm I'm in Christ. The old things, they're gone. They're completely gone. I'm a completely brand new person in the eyes of God then your life will go that way. Does it make sense? It makes a huge difference. It makes a huge difference if you choose to believe God. This is the opinion of a pitiful little man, so who cares? And I'm, I'm prefacing it that way. It's the opinion of a pitiful little man. In my opinion, unbelief is the biggest sin 
amongst the people of God that God needs to deal with. In my opinion, unbelief. When God says something, unbelief is so rampant amongst the people of God, right? Well, the Lord says of every Christian, he says that old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And you just have to believe him, right? That's who I am. The Apostle Paul, he said, I'm not, I'm not worthy. He said, I'm the least. But then he was so quick to say, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And what he meant is I'm new. I'm not a blaspheming bully anymore. I'm not covetous anymore, the Apostle Paul would say. That's his sin that he identifies. I'm not a persecutor of the church anymore. I'm completely forgiven, and I'm completely new. And he was driven by a passionate love relationship with Jesus Christ. Okay, I want to give you one more. Romans chapter 6, if you would. Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, in verse number 5. Romans 6, 5 says this, For if we have been united together in the likeness of His death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of His resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with Him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. And then please, I have this highlighted in my Bible. Please notice this. For he who has died has been freed from sin. It'd be so fun to give you more. That's why I'm suggesting maybe that would be a good study for the staff. All that we are in Christ. But I just wanted to give you these two. All of the old things, they're passed away. They're forgiven. God will never recall them to his mind again. You are, you are completely new in Christ. And then here, you are not a slave to sin. Don't let anybody ever tell you for the rest of your life that you're a slave to sin. Don't believe it. Believe God. You are meant to have victory. There's a theologian that I admire that I was reading recently, and, and he was talking about these things. And, and he said, um, before he understood this, he said, before um, failure was the norm, and I was astounded by success. And he said, now victory is the norm, and I'm astounded by by failure. You will never, I'm not talking about sinless perfection. I don't believe that at all. Nobody I know believes that at all. But victory, a life of victory, a life of intimacy, a life of freedom in Christ, that's my biggest prayer for all of you is that you will have hearts that are 100% free to walk with God, 100% free from the past, to love the Lord with an unhindered heart to serve the Lord with an unhindered heart, to love the lost. Boy, that's my prayer for you. Okay, back to 1 Corinthians, if you would. 15.10. So the Apostle Paul was honest with his sin. He acknowledges it right there in the passage. He talks about it openly. But it drives him to the grace of God. It makes him love the Lord and what the Lord had done for him. By the grace of God, I am what I am. His grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. So the first thing is the grace of God. By the grace of God, I am what I am. Uh, the second thing is he says, his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Um, I'm going to move through this pretty quickly. Um, let me just say one thing. I hope for clarity's sake, um, numerous ones of us have, like I, talked to you about when I filled up my life with a different kind of service for the Lord every night of the week. Do you remember that story? And we keep trying to illustrate that, that service can be an idol. Um, but I, I want to make the point here that the grace of God in your life should produce an incredibly hard worker for Christ. 
In fact, if the grace of God in your life does not produce an incredibly hard worker for Christ, something is wrong. Does that make sense? He says, I labored more abundantly than they all. In the context, he's either saying, I labored, it's brutal. This whole, this whole man-boy part of society, right? The, the guy who's 32 and he still lives in his mom's basement and he works eight hours a day, uh, but he eats his parents' food and he's got a 96-inch television and four game systems. And he goes, he goes to work during the day and then he gets takeout on the way home and then he sits and plays video games for eight hours every night. It's, it's the whole man-boy thing. It's just killing us, guys. We have to grow up, right? We have to grow up. When I was a child, I thought as a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. I think this week, men, I think this week could be a turning point for many of you where you make a mental decision. I'm not going to live like a man boy. I'm not going to live like a little boy. I'm not going to play anymore. Now, I don't know if I should say this or not. Honestly, it's kind of hard to figure out what you should say, what you should not say. But based on the fact that the Apostle Paul would, would say, he would write letters, and he would say, you know what manner of life I lived among you. And then he would talk about it, right? I'm saying this for your encouragement. And Lord, rebuke me if I'm wrong for this. I got married at 21 years old. I moved back to Topeka, Kansas at 22 years old. At 22 years old, I started a full-time job. Pretty soon, I wasn't making enough, so I added to that a part-time job. I was preaching three times a month. I, we, I went every week prepared for breaking the bread. I went every Wednesday prepared for the Bible study. I helped at the kids' club on Tuesday nights. I led the singing for a season at the chapel. All I'm trying to illustrate is 22 years old. Basically, my wife and I just made the decision before we were married, actually, that we're all in. Jesus Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And we made a conscious mental decision that we are going to love the church and we are going to give ourselves for it. My daughter has, has grown up in a home where we have told her all of her life that Jesus Christ is the center of this home. And we're going to love what Jesus Christ loves. We're going to hate what Jesus Christ hates to the best of our ability by the grace of God. And, and Jesus Christ loves the church. And so when something impedes upon the church, it's not the church that's going to lose. It's going to be that other thing that loses. Now, I'm simply trying to just simply illustrate you are not too young to make a mental decision and to say, I am not going to live like a boy anymore. There is not one of you here that is too young. By definition, you have to be old enough to make the decision that I'm talking about to come to this camp. Does this make sense? Okay, so I'm challenging you, men. I'm challenging you. The Apostle Paul, he says, quit ye like men in the King James, right? Like play the man. David, on his deathbed, he called Solomon to himself, and he says these words to Solomon. Be strong and prove yourself a man. Walk in the ways of the Lord your God. Keep his commandments and his statutes and hold fast. That's a warrior to his son, right? The whole man-boy thing, it's kind of ridiculous, um, but it's also very, very sad. And it's kind of killing us as a church. We need men to be men. I'm saying this. I, I love you guys. And the Lord knows that that's 100% true. I long for you guys. I pray for you guys. I actually labor in prayer for you guys. I think for some of you this week, I think for many of you this week, men and women alike, I think that this could be a radical turning point in your life. Amen? Amen. Yeah. God help us. The Apostle Paul, he says, the grace, By the grace of God, I am what I am. His grace toward me was not wasted, but I labored more abundantly than they all. And then finally, he just acknowledges this. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. So finally, he, he, he starts out with sin. And then he says, But I'm a brand new creation in Christ. Right? And I, I'm just taking the theology of Paul and inserting it. He starts with his sin, but he says, but I'm a completely new creation in Christ. This, cre this being a new creation has made me an incredibly hard worker for Christ. And then he finally, he finally says, but it wasn't really me. Um, it was all the grace of God laboring through me. How are you going to be successful as you leave Turkey Hill Ranch Bible Camp Discipleship 2017? Well, Colossians would say the same way you got saved, that's how you carry on. 
by grace through faith. So please, guys, for the glory and pleasure of Jesus Christ, for your own eternal blessing and blessing in this life, boy, carry on by grace through faith. Don't ever forget who you are. And when your life doesn't match who you are, run to the cross, confess it, weep, thank the Lord for washing your feet, and just go right back to believing who Christ has made you and just carry on that way. Father, we just want to say one more time that we love you. We just want to lay this at your feet and say that you're an amazing God. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for salvation. Thank you, Father, for... Um, I don't know, Lord... In eternity past, before the angels, before, um, before this world, at some point, um, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit looked at each other, and you put this whole plan of salvation together. In your word, it says, the Lamb of God was slain before the foundation of the world. And then you made us and we chose sin. Lord, what was it like when Cain killed Abel? What was that first look like when Adam looked at Eve and Eve looked at Adam and they knew if they would not have sinned, then Cain would not have killed Abel? Lord, we've made such a mess of everything. And yet, right after sin, you, you come down and you make this promise. The seed of the woman will crush the serpent's head. We make it such a mess of everything to the extent that you flood the whole earth because every thought of their hearts was only evil continually. And then they come out of the ark and, and then you say, God will dwell in the tents of Shem. Your word is, is so filled with promises of your grace of your perfect plan of salvation that you orchestrated in your own mind. You pulled every aspect off of it off perfectly. You sent the Lord Jesus Christ three times. Three times in Psalm 22, he says, he says, um, he says, be not far, O Lord. And he became the sin bearer. He was identified with sin. He was made sin for us. So that we can have a reconciled relationship to an amazing God. Lord, my request is really simple. Um, you're such an incredibly beautiful God. You are so worth it. You're so worth anything that we could possibly give up for you. My request is that is that you would... Send my brothers and sisters out of this camp by grace through faith and that they would do well for you. I went to a camp just like this when I was 15. I went to a camp just like this when I was 16. I went to a camp just like this when I was 17. I went to a camp just like this when I was 18. Some of them did well. Some of their lives are a disaster, Lord. I really hate that. I look out here and I see precious souls that Jesus Christ, He thinks that they're amazing. He thinks they're beautiful. He thinks they're wonderful. Nobody wants them to do better than the Lord Jesus does. Lord, I really, I don't know what else to say. And so I commend them to your grace. You love them, Lord. I commend them to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord. Amen.